NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory presents the Von Karman Lecture, a series of talks by scientists and engineers who are exploring our planet, our solar system, and all that lies beyond. Hello and good evening to you, wherever you may be. Uh, whether you're in Coatesville, Pennsylvania, Winona, Minnesota, or here in California, welcome to the Von Karman Lecture Series. My name is Brian White. I work in the JPL's Office of Communication and Education. Um, welcome. How do we achieve what we thought was once impossible? And how do you take that faintest idea, the dream, uh, the sketch on the bar napkin, how do you turn that into a full-blown mission? Where such stuff as dreams are made on, and our little life is rounded with sleep. Now, you may notice we're doing something a little different today. We're sitting here on stage. It's going to be more of a discussion versus a, uh, a full-blown talk at you. Um, our speaker tonight has been with JPL since 1984 and has worked with several mission and program areas. He's been a system engineer in the astrophysics division, has zero sense of humor whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> Telecommunications and Mission Systems Manager in the Deep Space Network serving the Mars missions. Uh, manager of the Cassini S Science Planning and Operations, the Galileo Deputy Sequence Team Chief, the Voyager Science Sequence Coordinator for the Uranus and Neptune Encounter. I could go on and on and on. Today, I won't. Today, he is the lead study architect of JPL's Innovation Foundry A Team. Please welcome Dr. Randy Wesson. Well, let's get into it. Well, it's your bio. You wrote it for me, so Got I want to make sure. <laughs> I made it all up. We're talking about ideas becoming reality, and more specifically, NASA JPL missions, and right. where do they come from? Uh, who gets to decide? That's where we're going, and you all are going to do it. That's right. Yeah. Um, NASA has changed over the years. So before the mid-1990s, NASA would do what's called assigned missions. They'd go, okay, the Goddard Space Flight Center, here's... You know, 200 million, do this. Ames Research Center, I want you to do this. And they, JPL, do this. They would just assign missions to the different NASA centers. By the mid 1990s, two things happened that led us to where we are today. One, um, NASA was getting a little mad at us because they would come to JPL and say, I have this great idea about a mission. I want a rover on Mars. What does it look like? What, it, what does it cost? And we wouldn't know, so we'd actually have to take a bunch of months, develop it. It would cost some money to develop that stuff, and then we'd do this one at a time. Um, it was just too long and too expensive to do that. So in the mid-1990s, they did this. They came up with what was called the Team X, and it's called Concurrent Collaborative Engineering. And what they do is they have chairs, and each chair has a title. So they put the eight classical spacecraft chairs, so power, thermal, structure, command data handling, and so on. They'd have the science chairs, the science and the science instrument. They'd have programmatic, so you'd have risk, cost chairs, system engineering. And they'd put them all in a room with connected spreadsheets. So now when someone is doing a design and the science guy goes, you know, I need a little bit more coverage. He'd lean over and tell the science instrument chair, hey, I need more coverage. And then she would put in a different detector to get that coverage. And as soon as she selected that chip, it would hit the cost chair, the mass chair, and the power chair. And it's almost like ordered chaos, but we could come up with a point design in about three days. We can come up with a full up mission concept to the parts and get a cost, a mass, beginning of life power, end of life power in about three days. So that was Team X in this collaborative engineering environment. So that solved one problem. The next challenge we ran into was the NASA administrator at the time, Dan Golden. He wanted to darken the sky with spacecraft. Now, before that, we were doing like a mission once a decade. Well, to darken the sky, you're launching one or two a year, and you just keep doing it. How do you pick the missions? For the assigned mission, it was easy. The science community would say, these are the missions I want. And the NASA would just assign those based on the priority of the science community. When it came to competitions, what they said is, oh, for discovery, I've got $550 million. Who wants to do what? And they would let the principal investigator propose concepts. And they'd have to team up with an industry partner that was going to build the spacecraft and a NASA center that was going to manage the whole contract. And those are called competitions, and they were just competed. 
Now, in order to handle that, we actually had to generate proposals that responded to what NASA needed. So we started generating these, we called them war rooms, where they're dedicated rooms, and you put the whole proposals up there describing what's going on there. And you would actually, for a, the first step proposal, the first thing out of the gate, you had three months to write this book. And NASA tries to limit the number of books, so they're looking for any excuse to reject these things. You know, you're supposed to do this in 16 pages. It's 17. You're out of there. And just they look for compliance first, so we have to make sure we follow the letter of the law of the instructions that we get in the announcement of opportunity to make these proposals, and then we make it NASA's problem to decide which ones to select. I'm going to keep going unless you have a No, I should. Okay. Yeah, please. Um, one of the problems that we ran into, and now we're getting into the 2005 time frame, people realize that um, proposals are now taking more and more laboratory resources, so we better make our own office to do this. So in 2005, they set up what was called the Strategic Planning and Project Formulation Office. Planning and formulation. Um, the chief engineer at the time, Mark Adler, re recognized that there was a problem. If somebody comes to me with a rover, well, two people come to me with a rover design, and this one's got three years of work behind it, and this one was a good idea in the shower this morning, <laughs> how do I tell the difference in how mature the idea is? So what he did is, modeling after a scale that we already had called technology readiness levels of how mature a widget is, he came up with this, TRLs, excuse me, CMLs, concept maturity levels, and I'm only going to talk about the first four just to give this a perspective. Uh, CML1, co um, concept maturity level, is the idea generation or the cocktail napkin stage. This is where you do the brainstorming. CML2, this is where you do feasibility. Does it violate a law of nature? Three is trade space exploration. And a good example of a trade space, if I got this great rover, and I think it's going to go one kilometer and stop at six sites. Why not go two kilometers and stop at three sites? Why not go only 500 meters and stop at 12 sites? What's more important, the driving or the drilling? Well, there's a trade that has to be made there. And all too often in this business, people fall in love with the concept and they just go forward. They're not looking for how to make this the optimum concept. So what we do is we now force people to go through the Constant maturity level one, the idea generation, two, feasibility, three, trade space. Um, for you scientists out there, I don't believe you start at CML1 that says, hey, let's do a Mars orbiter in a polar orbit at 250 kilometers. It really starts with the science question. Was there ever long standing water on the surface? Well, how do I answer that? What measurement do I have to make? What box makes that measurement? Where does that box have to be? Oh, that's a 250 kilometer orbit in a polar yeah. orbit. So when you're coming up with those, so a lot of these questions are coming from the decadal survey. Right? Yes. And the decadal survey decadal every 10 years. Every 10 years in Earth, solar system, and astrophysics. And there's a group of, of people, experts, and they say, these are the things we want to do for the next 10 years, yep. which can kind of guide those questions. Yes. So then they bring them to you, and you are, you're not TMEX. Correct. TMEX, I, I got confused first time I heard this, because I thought TMEX is it. TMEX is number one. Team X is at CML4. They're doing the point design. They realized in about, I think it was like 2011, that we needed some sort of pre or some group of people to work on stuff before Team X. So like, I'm going to show you a picture of a uh, lunar skylight. Um, if I want to study one of these openings in, into a planet, if I said, I want to study a skylight on, on Mars or Moon, how would you do it? If I went to Team X, they don't have enough material to start with. So you came to the A team, which is short for architecture team. We get all these quotes about the kernel and face and BA. Oh, anyway, <laughs> so we get all those things. But basically, this was a way of putting the right people in the room that have the right discipline to actually be the subject matter expert for this concept. And then we brainstorm ideas. So in 2011, we set up this. This is a place where ideas come from. We call it left field. So. <laughs> and the patio is called out there. I tried to have a conference room called in here, but they don't like that. But this is left field, OK? And one of the things we do at concept maturity level one, the, the cocktail napkin stage, is brainstorming. And when we brainstorm, we tell everybody that when I have a problem and I want you to write ideas on a Post-it, 
which looks like this. We just, we just write them down a board, and then we bin them, and then we vote on these things. We say we want everybody to come with at least one bad idea. Not because we want to implement bad ideas, but usually you have a tendency to have blinders and say, this is the way we do things. And we can't live that way. We need to be able to open up the boundaries. Because just because we haven't done it before doesn't mean you can't do it. I love this bad idea. Has there been a moment when the bad idea has actually been an idea you're like, actually, that's not a bad idea. Let's stick with that idea. Well, to me, there's no such thing as a bad idea. OK. I'm just quoting you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, it's something that pushes the envelope. OK. All right? All right. So one of the things that um, what I use to help me uh, when it comes to idea generation, uh, I like the correct use of the word impossible. Now, don't ask me about where I learned this from. It was volitional physics, but that's another whole sideline. But the, def the true definition, I believe, for the word impossible is that which violates a natural law. So as an example, can a spacecraft go faster than the speed of light? No. With our current understanding, that's impossible. Can a human being live to be 200 or 300 years old? Well, if I can't point to what it violates, it just means we don't know how to do it. So that's one filter I use for a good idea. And you know, people use the word impossibly poorly all the time. My favorite example, and I, I collect some weird space stuff, I've got these two papers that are just bounded together. They're nothing fancy. It was by an astronomer named Simon Newcomb in the early 1900s. His first paper in 1902 is titled, Is the Airship Coming? And he wrote why it was impossible to have a heavier than aircraft. This was a year before the Wright brothers. <laughs> the second paper that is mounted to this thing, and, and to be known through history for this just kills me, um, the second paper is entitled, The Prospects of Aerial Navigation. It was written in 1907, uh, why he was wrong, why it is possible to have heavier than aircraft, but why it will never be commercially viable. <laughs> you know, I'm just going to like, oh, man, guys, that's not how you want to get known. So whenever I hear someone say, that's impossible, or that's not the way you do it, warning signals go off in my mind. Because I don't care how we did it. We want to do something new. And one of the really wonderful things about the Jet Propulsion Laboratory is we only want to do missions that no one else has ever done before. You want to do an orbit of Mars, go to Lockheed Martin, go to Ball Brothers. We want to do the mobility systems. We want to do the space based interferometers. We want to do the subsurface exploration. That's where we want to play. Yeah, these, this is amazing. Um, I love that definition of impossible. So it works. when we're talking about something like, we've we got a full-scale model of Voyager. We're talking about these missions that go out there and beyond what we thought was possible. Yeah. Um, what would be something that you would, OK, talk me through something right now. Let's say let's have a mission out there. I want something like Voyager. And I end up going through you guys through the very beginning. How do I talk about going out there? Well, the, the first challenge is you always want to start with science requirements. We're not doing this to do engineering. We're doing this to do science. We use engineering to enable us acquiring the science. Okay. okay? And so it really starts with some sort of scientific question that we want to do. Okay. So I'm going to lead into this interesting concept here. Yeah. Um, if you look at this, this is an interstellar mission broken up into phases. So you've got, uh, wow, that dot goes there. This is the, this is the acceleration. It's all propulsion the long survival, the deceleration to the system, getting ready for the encounter in that exoplanet system on another world, the science to acquire that data, and then the playback. Well, everybody in their, their mother's brother is all working on trying to figure out how to go faster than Voyager. Our rule of thumb was we'd like to be able to go 10 times faster than Voyager. For you guys that are counting, that's a little bit more than a year from here to Neptune. We're talking about that kind of speed. It's not the 12 years that Voyager did it. Uh, even at that speed, I mean, Voyager right now at a million miles per day, which I think is pretty, not too shabby, that would take 72,000 years to get to the nearest star, and we're not even going in that direction, and stars move. But other than that, and if you go 10 times faster, that's only 7,000 years. That's still not in my lifetime, and I'm kind of, I'm at the back nine, okay? <laughs> but the question that we proposed here was, and let's, let's zoom in on this thing. You can see 
this is the tail end is being displayed here. Let's say we could take 40 years to go to Proxima Centauri, which is the closest star. We know it's got a, we call them exoplanets, planets around other star systems. Let's make it somebody else's problem figuring out how to speed up, survive, and slow down. When you get there after 40 years, the science that this spacecraft was designed for has probably already been done on the ground because astronomers on the ground are not waiting for you guys to get there in 40 years. They're still working on the problem. In addition, the technology is old. Voyager's 41 years is going to be 42 years. I think it's a big memory is, is four, four uh, kilobytes of memory. This thing would run doors around that. I would have loved to have this thing running that spacecraft. <laughs> so the technology old. So now how could you get around that? So one idea that we were toying with that was really kind of science fiction was 4D printing. You've heard of 3D printers doing additive manufacturing. You know your printer at home, you have a magenta cartridge and a cyan cartridge and a black cartridge head. What happens if you have a 3D printer and now you put in a copper head, an aluminum head, a Teflon head, a, all the different materials, and now you build up all the circuitry and all the functionality of this thing so that when it's done, you have something that works. I'm looking at these guys going, you're talking about building a replicator, right? Is, is, is that where I am? Um, and the idea that we're talking about is, wouldn't it be fun that after you decelerate down, you have a 4D printer on your spacecraft and you eat your propellant tanks to make your new instruments and optical system and pointing system, and then after the encounter, you eat your instruments to make your telecom system? <laughs> There'd be like a 95% you know, loss with each stage, but you could evolve the spacecraft. Like, why not, right? So, you know, we're not saying we're going to do this tomorrow, but it points in the direction of the things that we might need to try to enable some future capability. Yeah. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, I heard somebody, well, I heard somebody say well, cool in the front. Well, fried there, yeah. right? Well, okay. no. <laughs> um, so we, you start with the science. You start with the science question. That's right. How do you come up with a good science question? Um, the science question really first comes from the decadal surveys. Again, we're always pointing back to science, whether it's an, a NASA advisor group or decadal survey. We want to find the compelling science question that we want to go after. And one of the things that we try to do is, in our minds, there's a difference between a goal and an objective. A goal is something grandiose and qualitative. An objective is something really specific and quantitative. Yeah. So as an example, uh, a goal in NASA's solar system decal is, I want to find if there's life or was life in the solar system. That's huge. I mean, I mean how do you handle something like that? What you could do is try to make it down more quantifiable and more bite-sized and say, OK, I'm going to develop a lander that's going to land at this latitude and longitude and within top five centimeters look for organics. It's addressing that goal, but it's much more specific and something to get my hands around. So we make them do um, the science. Okay. We make sure they have a hypothesis and a prediction. You know, if I'm, if I'm Newton, I go, I drop an apple, it falls. Well, my hypothesis is gravitational force. It's 1 over r squared. My prediction is, if I drop the card over there, which I have never done ever before, that it'll fall at 1 over r squared. So then I go over there and I drop it. And if it works, I go, ooh, a coincidence. Three times is a trend. <laughs> Four, I mean, it, and it just keeps going. And, and each time you're trying to validate these things, OK? So we make them come up with a hypothesis and a prediction. And one of my coworkers, uh, Dr. Al Nash, that I love, he says, when you're coming up with a hypothesis, it has to be a barroom brawl. And I look at him and I go, barroom brawl? And he goes, yeah, if I say more snow leads to more snow runoff, that's kind of a duh statement. I mean, it doesn't, if I said that the lack of snow on the mountains is going to cause rebounding in Greenland, ooh, not everybody's going to buy that. So now we, have, we can have a fight over that. Okay. So to make a compelling hypothesis, it's, it's got to have the barroom brawl. It's got to be bold. Right. Yeah. Then the next thing we do is uh, we find that scientists are phenomenal at writing peer-reviewed journal articles. They're not so hot at communicating to the general public and making people care about it. <laughs> so what we try to do is we actually use uh, techniques, because we've been going to all different industries to find ways to do it. We went to Disney for this one. This is Pixar. It's storytelling. And what they do is they make everybody writing a story complete these sag uh, segments of a fragments of a sentence. Once upon a time there was, every day, one day, because of that, because of that, until finally. <laughs> so let me show you how this thing works. 
Uh, this is Finding Nemo. You can find this uh, on the internet. It's great. <laughs> just, just, I mean, it's all out there. This is Nemo. Once upon a time, there was a widowed fish named Marlin who was extremely protective of his only son, Nemo. Every day, Marlin uh, warned Nemo of the ocean's dangers and implored him not to swim far away. One day, in an act of defiance, Nemo ignored his father's warnings and swam into the open water. Because of that, he is captured by a diver and ends up in a fish tank of a dentist in Disney. Because of that, Marlin sets off on a journey to recover Nemo and enlisting the help of the other sea creatures along the way. Until finally, Marlin and Nemo find each other, reunite, and learn that love depends on trust. Spoiler alert. Yeah, really. <laughs> Spoiler alert. That is the movie. You can sit there and go, yes, that is it. Now you go, what does that have to do with NASA? Well, this same technique works for us to get the science community to answer, to tell us their story. So what we'll do is we'll bring a science team into the room. We'll give them these six fragments of a sentence. And we have each guy write their own story. And surprise, surprise, they're all writing their own story. Well, then we make them work on one story. And the story could look like this. This is about Europa. It's a moon of Jupiter that has an ice field. It was an NASA advisor group. And look what they did. Once upon a time, scientists saw evidence of a liquid water ocean on Europa. Every day, scientists wondered if this ocean could support life. <laughs> One day, studies indicated that to support life, there must be some evidence of an exchange of material between the ocean and surface. Because of that, NASA decided to send a lander to Europa to look for biosignatures. Because of that, a seismic network was established on Europa to listen to the moon's quakes. Until finally, scientists were able to determine the thickness of the moon's crust, the activity of its ocean, and in turn, its habitability. That's a compelling science story. Everybody understands that. So we make them come up with their science question, their hypothesis prediction, and we make them do this too. And what happens is this can actually lead to different things. Now, I'm not saying that the A team is the brainstorms of every idea that comes to the lab. It does not. We have a lot of brilliant and creative minds out there. People may come with us just to understand the feasibility of their concept. They may come to us just to understand the trade to make sure they have the optimum design. So as an example, one thing that came through us was this. Um, this is something that we're actually doing in 2020, which is so cool. <laughs> if you look at 97, we had a little Sojourner rover. That rover, the Pathfinder team didn't want. It was sitting on their solar arrays, blocking the light. But having mobility was so cool that we actually were able to do it, and that led to spirit, opportunity, curiosity, and Mars 2020 rovers. Well, what you're seeing this animation of is we've got the go-ahead that on 2020, we're putting a two-kilogram helicopter on that vehicle. So once the rover lands, we're going to pull out this helicopter. We're going to drive away and look at it. And we're going to watch to see if this thing lifts. And to prove ourselves we can get to work, we went to our high base. We, we tied this thing to the floor. We sucked out the atmosphere, 7,000 carbon dioxide. And the thing was able to generate lift. It's the wrong gravity field, it's the wrong temperature, but it flies. We've already had eight team studies that say, hey, if you had a 35 to 45 kilogram helicopter, what could you do? Could you fly in the big canyon, Valles Marineris, and go look at the sidewalls? Maybe see a femur sticking out of the strata? Oh, that would be so cool. <laughs> I mean, that would be great. But this stuff does work. Um, I'm going to keep going unless you have a yeah, question for no, me. No, 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 no. This, but this is where it comes. This is, yeah, we can talk about ideas and these things that you want to go out there and do these things. But what is some of the stuff that's gone through you already? What are some of these ideas that missions people might have even heard of or not yet? And what is that? That's what I think okay. people are here to see as well. Well, one idea that's come through us from a feasibility point of view, so it wasn't our idea, yeah. was related to this. This is an image of the surface of Mars, and you'll notice there's two big black dots. And you'll look at yourself and you go, what the heck is that? So you bring Mars Reconnaissance over there with the big camera, the high-rise instrument, and we go, photograph those. And it looks like that. They're cave openings. We call these things skylights, which I alluded to before. So picture a lava tube that you know, was flowing billions of years ago, and you had all these episodic flows through it, coating the, the, this tube. And then after the core turned off and the lava flows turned off, you got this tunnel there. And then over the eons, a piece of the top caves in. That's what we think these things are, that these are, these are, these are skylights to these cave openings. And we think the tube itself may not be that interesting because it should be uniform with the last flow. 
What we want to see is the strata as you go through this. So we're working on some technologies like this. This is a gecko climber. Um, you know, right now that's pretty teeny, but that's also in a gravity field. But one of the proposals we're doing for the moon, because the moon has skylights too, is this. This is called Moon Diver. We're going to land next to the opening and take that axle, which is on a cable, and roll it down the sidewalls. Now, to first order, we might have, you know, um, oh, it was like a kilometer. Okay. No, it's, it's probably like 100 meters to the opening, 100 meters down, 100 meters in through the tube. But the thing that's cool is as you're going down the, the sidewalls, you have instruments on the axle of that instrument so that now you can see the stratification and the trapped solar wind particles of how the sun was behaving billions of years ago. So this is one that we did feasibility on, and it's going to, going to, uh, to NASA this, uh, this fall. Well, really now. Yep. Um, another one that just kills us that we just love, this is Jupiter. It's, it's nice and fun. It's got a, just a horrific radiation environment. It's got scads of moons. You've got the four big Galilean ones. There's one called Europa. It looks like a cue ball that you did a felt tip pen to draw lines on it, so it's very, very smooth and it's ice. It's got the density pretty close to that of an ice cube, <clears throat> so we know it's mostly water. But the Galileo spacecraft went by, and it saw a weak magnetic signature. And you go, well, how do you get an ice cube to have a little bit of a magnetic signature? The best theory is that we have liquid water, salt oceans circulating under that ice field. So we think it looks like this. Now, we don't know if that ice field is a meter thick or a hundred kilometers thick. We have no idea how thick it is. But we think the amount of liquid water in there is twice the amount of all the water on the oceans on Earth. So there's a lot of it. <laughs> so then, <laughs> yeah. You, you could have a party and never run out of ice, right? <laughs> um, the question was, say you could get to Jupiter. Well, we can get to Jupiter. Say you can survive the environment and you can get through the ice. Where would be the best place to explore? Is it along the ocean bottom looking at hydrothermal vents? Is it being a fishy and swimming through the, the water? Or would it be where the ice and the water meet? And to our science community, it's this interface between the ice and water because heat from the thermal vents circulates stuff up, and Jupiter's radiation is radiating the ice on the top, which is falling down. So that interface is really interesting. So now the question is, how do you explore that? As a national research laboratory, we get to work on technologies that really don't have a mission funded, but is developing capability for some future mission. So one of the things we worked on for this particular problem this is up in Alaska. It's a frozen lake. There's a square yellow box in the right corner because National Geographic dumped a camera in the bottom of this lake. We take out this little rover. It's named Bruy, and, and if you have good eyes, you'll see on the bottom. We turn it on, and we let it go. And the cool thing about it is this bad boy is buoyant. So it floats up to the ice, and now it drives on the bottom of the ice. And now, let's get this straight. You know, we were able to command this from JPL, but you still got to figure out how to get it a half billion miles out, how to get it through kilometers of ice, how to get it to go through, how to get power and commands to it, how to get data from it, how to power it. But right now, we're working on the mobility system. <laughs> so, so this is coming to a theater near you, probably in your lifetime. <laughs> but I mean, it, it's something really pretty wild. And not every concept goes through the architecture scheme because they may not need to. We're kind of like a service organization where we provide a capability where we have our folks on the architecture team. And we just tell people that if you have a problem in either coming up with an idea for something or want to check out feasibility or want to um, look at the trades to make sure you have them designed, you can come to us. We initially thought when we developed this capability in 2012 that, you know, we do about 12 a year. Two years ago, we did 61 studies. Last year, we did 66. Uh, the, my boss who's doing this talk tomorrow, Steve Matusak, he claims that we're now going to be doing 60 studies every year, which is just a lot. But we do not have a shortage of ideas. Uh, one of the other last ideas that I really like is exoplanets. 
No, yeah. Okay, okay, right, I just to make sure. I'll wait till you're done with exoplanets. Okay. Yeah. Exoplanets are planets around other star systems, okay? The problem is they're really dim compared to the sunlight coming, star, the starlight coming off of that star. We think it's about, and you know, your, your mileage will vary, but it's like 10 billion to one. They say trying to see the light reflected off an exoplanet is like trying to image a firefly an inch away from a lighthouse at night. And because of zodiacal dust, the dust in our solar system and the dust that's probably in that solar system, you have to do this on a foggy night. That's the problem we're trying to solve. So one way of doing this is you take your finger and you put it in front of the light bulb so you can see stuff next to it. These are called coronagraphs. We have this occulting disk inside the telescope. But because the disk is small and it's inside the telescope, you still get the fraction of light around that. And if it's 10 billion to one, I mean, think about what you're doing. You're saying, okay, I'm going to take these 10 billion photons. I'm going to take 9 billion, 909 million, 990,000, 999, put them over there, and put the one I need there. And then I'm going to take the next 10 billion and put the one there. And it's got to be the right one. Yeah, right. Take the next 10 billion and put that there until you build up enough signal to see this. So you can't tolerate a little bit of scattered light around this occulting disk. So we find that exoplanets come in many different flavors. You can think of it as a zoo of these things. There are over 4,000 of these things detected, and I can't keep up with it, so I'm just, you have a bunch of numbers because first you've got to have a detection of them, and then, you know, if I detect it, I say, hey, Brian, yep. there's an exoplanet. you got to go, hey, Randy, you're right. I go, ah, oh, it's confirmed. Yeah, <laughs> Somebody right. independent has to confirm it. So there's what you detected and what's confirmed, and then what's in the habitable zone, it just goes on and on. But we initially started finding these, we call hot Jupiters. Picture Jupiters that are in their system well inside the orbit of where Mercury would have been. Their year is a day long or so. So we call them hot Jupiters. So they're just hauling buns and they're really hot and really close. <laughs> we find these guys, these are called orphan worlds. Picture a Jupiter-sized object gets thrown into that solar system and it just coasts forever in the darkness of space between stars. It's probably still warm from its, the helium seeking in its atmosphere and it's just floating through interstellar space. Um, we found ones based on the density, so this is kind of made up. We call them ocean worlds, not the Kevin Cosner kind of ocean worlds, ocean ocean kind of worlds where we really think it's just the whole surface is covered with water based on our density arguments. So the question is, how do you put a bigger thumb over the star to limit the light that comes around it so you can see things near it? Okay. So one of the things we're working on, it's up the hill, it's called a star shade. So here you have a telescope. The yellow thing is the star shade. You open up a band and it does its first deploy and then its second deploy. This thing could be as much as 75 feet across. The petals are like, you know, 8, 12 feet long, 16 feet long. To micron tolerance, tolerances, you can cut yourself on these things sharply. You then send it 20, 30,000 miles and you let it slide in front of the star system so you can directly image stars, planets around other star systems. We actually had to hire an origami expert to help us work that thing out. I mean, <laughs> how, how do you pack that? I mean, it was just nuts. Well, that's ideas and these things can come from anywhere. You've talked about oh, yeah. how these teams not always are just you all. You can bring in people right. from all over. We expert. don't have the expert in everything. Yeah. We don't. Um, and it's something that I, I also appreciate. You talk about, you've told me before, you're OK saying the words, I don't know. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. We don't know most of this stuff. You know, we have little pink meat here, and we try to understand our order of the universe. But think about what we're doing here, guys. We are trying to get out into our solar system. Neptune is four light hours. What's Voyager? 16 hours, 20 hours, somewhere in that ballpark, light hours away. In our star system, in our galaxy, you have, depending on how you count, 200 to 400 billion suns. And for every sun, there's hundreds to thousands of galaxies, each with hundreds of billions of suns. And now we're finding that in our, so, in our um, part of the galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, it seems like every star has planets. We're not saying they're all habitable, but there's a lot of real estate out there. I mean, there's a great quote by uh, Arthur C. Clarke that goes, sometimes I think we're alone in the universe, sometimes I think we're not. Either answer is terrifying. <laughs> I mean, just, and, you know, we're sticking our little cosmic toe out, just trying to just see where we are in our place. I mean, there really is this 
pale blue dot. We're just us in the void of space. And one of the burning questions of NASA is, are we alone? And how did life start here? We don't even have good definitions for the word life. I mean, I know a eukaryote, a cell with, with, with organelles and nuclei, that's definitely alive. And prokaryotes, stuff, you know, bags of goo, I'm pretty sure those are alive. Viruses that need these guys' machinery to make more of themselves, I'm not sure if that's alive. And a prion, which is just a molecule, I'm pretty sure that's not alive. But, and, and this is getting really way off topic, but I mean, if, if you think about it, when I went to school, the old days, life was, starts with plants, they take sunlight, make sugars, animals eat the plants, animals eat the animals, we go to McDonald's. There it was, right? <laughs> Can I say McDonald's? Yeah. <laughs> well, then in 1977, by the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, we found organisms living off of heat. Depending on you know, what you prescribe to, we either call that pyrosynthesis or chemosynthesis. If you're a physicist, energy is energy. Why not acoustic synthesis? Why not magnetosynthesis? You could argue that the early Earth had many different types of primary producers, but the photosynthetic plants were most efficient. They took over the whole tops of the ocean. They crawled down on land, took everything over there. When they ran out of real estate, they tried to go to the bottom of the ocean to go after the pyrosynthetic guys because they're just so efficient at using sunlight. But they ran out of light before they got down there. So if we're looking for life again, again, talk about impossible or possible. If it's got an energy gradient, if it's got uh, liquid water, and it's got carbons, why not? And as we're looking out there, we're gonna. That's these are more of these science questions that we're. Absolutely. You, know, you got to go through the Nemo thing, the six yeah, 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 and yeah, get yeah. to there. Uh, the last thing I want to talk about before we get to your final slides are actually this rock that's sitting right in front of us. It's not a rock. I apologize for calling it a rock. Um, <laughs> okay. You mind telling everybody what it actually is? I needed a prop to hide the monitor. So I brought a meteorite. Remember, it's meteoroids in space, a meteor through the atmosphere. It's a meteorite. It's kind of big enough to hide the monitor. Uh, meteorites come in three flavors. There's the iron nickel kind, there's the iron nickel with rock, and then there's just the rock. And what happens is, if I have an asteroid out there and it, another guy slams into it, it either breaks into pieces or it sticks. If it sticks, it deposits its energy into it so it heats up. As more and more rocks hit each other, I called them rocks. Yeah, yeah. As, oh, they, as they hit each other, this thing gets bigger and bigger and hotter and hotter. The heavy stuff starts to sink, so the iron and nickel sinks, and the, the rocky stuff floats. So you're making a proto-world. Your iron is going to be your proto-core. Your metal rocky is your mantle, and your, your rock is the crust. It starts to differentiate. As this thing is growing up trying to become a planet, something mashed into it, and this time rather than adding heat, it just broke the whole thing up. So this is iron nickel meteorite. It's a Campo del Cielo from Argentina, found in the 1500s. They think it hit 5,000 years ago. This is all iron, so this is the proto-core of a, of a world wannabe that got disrupted. And the reason why it's here is one of the missions that went through us for feasibility was a mission called Psyche. It's the 16th one that was known in the asteroid belt. It's about 120 miles across. It's an iron nickel asteroid with the crust blown off. So we think it's a naked core. So just picture this rock about 120 miles across. Something that would fit between here and San Diego. That's what we're going to explore with, with the Psyche mission. Now I'm going to do the finals. Please do. I want to see. I want to end with a series of images that, that just, just blow me away. They're not that fancy, but just, just look at this. On your left, that is a picture of the Earth from low Earth orbit. The middle is a picture of the Earth as seen from the moon. On the right, you don't know that, so I'm going to tell you, that is a picture from the surface of Mars. And do you see that red circle? Oops, that red circle? Yes. Yeah, OK, I'm just making sure I see it right. That, that white dot is the Earth as seen from the surface of Mars. Here is Saturn, and you're behind it. So you're looking towards the sun. The, the disk itself is blocking the sunlight, and you just get the glow of the rings. We really had to punch this thing up, but in that circle, that's the Earth from a billion miles away. So I want to end with a quote by one of my heroes, Konstantin Edvardovich Tsiolkovsky, one of the fathers of astronautics. The Earth is the cradle of the mind, but one cannot live in the cradle forever. Thank you very much.
41 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. We are going to open it up for some questions now. Now, if you're here... Well, i got questions. You, you've got oh, questions. Yeah, i got tons of questions. I was enjoying watching some people's face. Your face in particular was just... I was watching this. It was that's amazing. It's wonderful. Because right. okay. that's what this place is about. If you have questions, this microphone right over here, if you're here on Lab, if you're joining us at home uh, on Ustream or YouTube, if you ask your questions, uh, we've got people up there monitoring those. They'll be able to bring them in. So who's got the first question? So go ahead and step yeah. on up to... <laughs> so you can, if you've got questions, you can line up right behind the microphone right over there, if you like. Because if you don't line up, I'll ask you guys questions, and then we're really in trouble. Randy never stops teaching either. Um, we were setting up and talking about this, and Randy was telling everybody all about and it, but doesn't, I, I'm just a big fan. So, first question. Lots of questions edited down to two. Okay. Is there an engineering or science discipline for origami so that you can fold this stuff up, open it, and the circuits all connect? Is, is there a specific discipline for that? There is, not here at the laboratory. That's why we had to go to campus, to Caltech, to find uh, an expert origami guy. And I'm, I'm sure they have a, a fancier word for it, but there, there is a discipline, but it's probably more of an art form than an engineering form, even though I wonder if they'd get insulted by that. It's probably both. Now, my second of many, but my last I know. I'll be here a while. It's okay. <laughs> There's a new science mission that wants to put another rover on Mars. We, Mars we've worked it that yep. far. Yep. See, I paid attention. <laughs> it, have they ever looked at putting some kind of a, a compressed gas blower? on the rovers now so that if there is a dust storm, the solar panels can be blown clean and extend the life even more than the great extensions you guys have already done. Well, here's the issue here. There's a number of challenges with that. One, the 2020 rover is nuclear powered, not solar powered, so you don't want to put a blower on that. If you put a blower on a solar powered vehicle, now you're adding more mass and complexity. The rovers Spirit and Opportunity were designed for 90 days because we looked at the rate of dust deposition and tried to figure out how long we could go and make the patterns long enough. But the dust devils just would, you know, you, our power would decrease each day and then a dust devil would run over us and the power, you know, peaked back up and you go, thanks for the fish. I mean, it was just, it was just great. So adding more mass and complexity to do something that may be done naturally is one issue. The next question is, and this is kind of heretical, I mean, how long do you want a mission to last for? If you keep paying out for these extended missions, that's money you're taking away from the next mission. So the way to think about it is, say you put money away for vacation every two weeks. You have one every two years you're going to go on vacation. You're going to do it for two weeks. You're now in a place and you go, I want to stay here a third week. You're now taking money from your next vacation, so you're delaying that one. So when we say something should last a certain length, we really want it to last that long. That being said, most missions that have succeeded that didn't have an issue have already gone three, five times more than its primary mission anyway. So, so lifetime hasn't been an issue for our missions. We'd like to do the more and more capable stuff. Not now. How about later? Let's, we got a line there. And Randy, let's stick around. Yeah, afterwards. I'll stick around afterwards. After you can pet the rock here. and do all sorts of kind of good things. <laughs> the iron. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Hey, it seems as though that there is a lag or latency between the time that a scientific instrument is deployed and the time that it arrives to any particular time, uh, maybe 30, 40 years. How does NASA predict what society would likely want to use that particular instrument 30 years down the line, maybe 10 years down the line? You mentioned earlier that uh, sometimes scientists on Earth end up discovering uh, ideas. Yes. Um, one of the interesting things that we face is that technology, it's got a clock on it. The technology of now is the technology you can use now and is only good for a certain finite period of time. I would not use Saturn V technology to do rockets. Those guys were using vacuum tubes and, and copper-plated wire memory and all sorts of really horrific stuff. So it's really what you have the te technology now. So you don't want to deal with stuff that's going to be 40 years in the future because all the technology that you're working with is going to be outdated. So there's this dance between what is the burning science question of the day and what's the best technology that's flight proven that we know works in space that can actually survive the rigors of space to actually get you some of those answers. So we don't go that far in advance. We're, you know, I say we're good for 10, 
maybe 20 years. We're working on technologies for the next 20 years, but the technology of the day is only good for the near term right now. No. Thanks. I've yeah. actually got a good online follow-up question from that. It's from Trevor O, and he asked, is NASA planning on using reusable spacecraft in the future? Yes, I mean, here again, people would say, well, is it impossible to reuse spacecraft, uh, launch vehicles? Well, come on, when you fly from New York to D.C., you don't throw away the plane when you get to D.C. <laughs> Why did people say you couldn't reuse space, uh, launch vehicles? So one of the things that SpaceX has done that no one has ever done before and we're curious about is it's called supersonic retropropulsion. So here you launch your rocket, you're going at Mach lots. <laughs> Mach lots. <laughs> you do your first stage cutoff, you turn it around, you start falling, and now you're firing your engines in the direction that you're moving at high Mach numbers. So you're blowing your engine into the direction of travel. NASA never does it. We launch one way, we go the other way. To actually <laughs> do retro supersonic propulsion is nuts. But they're showing us how to do it, so we think it's great. So NASA, what NASA does, which is really lovely, is we try to develop capability and then push it out to the, the U.S. and the businesses as fast as we can because we want to set up new markets. In our charter, we're supposed to train the next generation of scientists and engineers and help the economic competitiveness in the United States. NASA doesn't do launch vehicles anymore. Those are your, those are your Boeings. Those are your uh, SpaceX's. There are all these other guys that are doing it. We want that to be their business, and we'll do the same thing with human transportation in space. Right now, NASA has four vehicles coming online. We're always going to try to push the stuff as far down as we can. So NASA's not going to do retro supersonic propulsion unless maybe we're landing on a world as we come in and we're trying to fire exhaust into that. But we want to set up commercial sectors to do that. Hi. So you mentioned earlier about how there are many concepts that could seem really crazy but not oh, yeah. necessarily be impossible. Yeah. Uh, are there any concepts that you heard that are you know, really crazy and out there but not impossible that fascinate you but never became mission concepts? The one I love, and they keep modifying it, so I'm going to tell you about a design they had a year ago and they've now changed it, but the idea was nuts. Um, Marco, I love you for this one. He... You know, astronomers like bigger and bigger primary mirrors for their telescopes. You know, the bigger you are, the further you can see, the dimmer the objects you can detect. Uh, Hubble is 2.4 meters. It's about an 8-foot primary piece of glass. Astronomers want to get bigger. So James Webb in infrared, it's like 6.5 meters. It's really like 21 feet across. Astronomers want to get bigger. Uh, one idea is the guy wants to make fine-grained, shiny dust put the dust in a spacecraft, send the spacecraft out to like L1 where the gravity is balanced between the Earth and the Moon, dump out the dust, which is fun to do in zero G to get that stuff out of there. <laughs> so you have this undulating cloud of dust particles just kind of sitting there in this gravity well between the Earth and the Moon. Then with six lasers, three on a side, you don't want to melt the grains. You want to use photon pressure to shape it into a primary mirror of any size. <laughs> oh, wait, it gets better. <laughs> then they want to have the lasers interfere with each other so you can change the average spacing between the grains so now you can tune it to what wavelength it'll reflect. <laughs> That's the granular imager concept. I love that one. And now they're getting away from lasers and they're trying to do it electrostatically. But I just love the concept. I mean, I, again, I'm not sure that's in your lifetime, but I just think this is it's just great. So, so that one is really, to me, on the edge of something that's, that's not daisies shooting lasers, but it's still out there. Thank you. You got it. Um, well, the next person stepping up to the microphone, Giancarlo Estevez, uh, asked if the A-team, if your team publishes things on methods. Do you publish anything on We this? do. Um, so the science storytelling stuff is out there, or uh, just how we organize the structure, because we're trying to get the stuff out there, and we're also trying to attract other people's attentions to find out how they do stuff. We've already been to Google X, there's Pixar, uh, Procter & Gamble. Um, we're not proud in terms of what you're out there, but any brainstorming organization we'd like to learn from, because we have not cornered the market in this stuff, but this is what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. And if there are other ways of doing it, you know, Disney Imagineering, is it, you know, US Cinema Labs or Carnegie Mellon, whatever, we'd like to hear how they do their brainstorming just to, just to keep improving our process. Cool. So we do work with others. Uh, first of all, I disagree with the introduction your cohort gave of you. You do have a sense of humor. <laughs> <laughs> 
No. And I have zero, so yes. <laughs> when, when I tell a joke to a woman and she doesn't laugh, I tell her, well, that's an engineering joke. They always find that funny. Does that funny. work? <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you're alive to tell it. So what's the question right now? Let, let's go to the question. Okay, so you, you're still talking to this guy out there. Yes. How, what is the range of the technology of receivers and transmitters? How far out are you going to be able to communicate with a probe? And we're referring to Voyager. 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 Um, it will die before we can not hear it. The trick we have to do is, since we can't change the hardware on the spacecraft, we have to talk slower and slower to make sure we hear those zeros and ones. So as we get further and further away, we do a lower and lower data rate. We've turned off the really hog of instruments, so like the imager and the guys that take high data volumes. So it's really fields and particles, the protons, electrons, the plasma waves, the magnetic field. So basically we're taking weather forecasts and we'll be able to hear it till it dies, which it'll be a sad day because that was my first spacecraft. Okay, good enough. Um, so I was really intrigued at how many projects uh, you guys are kind of researching at any given period of time. And, yeah. you know, 12 a year seems like it's somewhat manageable, but then, you know, you're talking 60, 70, whatever. We can be ambitious, right? Oh, yeah. Um, I think... I can see how a problem can arise when you're working on so many of these at a time. How do you kind of just document for posterity's sake and for the next person, but also for your own sakes to keep track of, kind sure. of which ideas work, which ideas you like, that sort of thing. So that, that's the one. And then the short follow-up question, which I was just curious about, on the Starshade, there were these little petals on the yes. side. I was just curious what those were about. They're petals. If you think of it, what you're trying to do is you're trying to make it transparent on the tips and getting more and more opaque as you get there. And that shape, that teardrop shape, actually is wavy because we're trying to suppress every photon that's trying to diffract around the edge of this thing. But, you know, when we do a studies to address your first point, we have a facilitator that leads the conversation. We have an agenda down to five-minute resolution. We have a study lead, an assistant study lead, that's responsible for making sure this is documented correctly on a wiki page. And we hire a documentarian to take the notes that the study lead and assistant study lead read because we want to be able to farm this for the next study. So I'm going to do another little segue real quick. One of the things that was fun, did you guys see Star Trek, was it four with the whales? The whales. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, do you remember when Scotty's looking for transparent aluminum to make the fish tank for the whales? Mm -hmm. Well, that stuff actually exists today. It's aluminum oxynitride. And they came to us and said, this material is transparent in all wavelengths except for a little bit of the mid-IR. What could you do with it? So we did a brainstorming session, and you know what the winning solution was? We want to make sample canisters out of this stuff, so when you put the sample in it and seal it up, you can still study it for the years it takes to go home. And if you die en route or you're burned up, at least you got something. Right now you're putting it in a can and it disappears. So we're always looking at these new technologies. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, um, so we know you are working on the new helicopter for, for yeah. the Mars 2020 rover. Yep. Uh, what other new components did you add on it that were new besides Curiosity? Uh, one of the fun instruments on it that I really love, one of our fantasies, is the way to reduce cost is to have a smaller payload so you use a smaller rocket and use less fuel. One of our, and it is a fantasy, we want to do a two-way mission that goes to Mars and lands with its tanks bone dry. Well, then how do you get back? The idea was you would suck in the atmosphere, crack the CO2 into carbons and oxygens, dig up ice, melt the water ice, split into hydrogens and oxygens, put the oxygens together, liquefy it, fill up the oxidizer tank, then take the carbon from the atmosphere with the hydrogen from the ice, make methane, liquefy it, and fill up your fuel tank. That's why Elon Musk is working on methane engines, okay? On the 2020 rover, we have a little baby instrument called MOXIE. It's very, very simple. Its job is to just do a proof of concept. This bad boy is going to suck in CO2, crack it, and just see how much oxygen it can make. MOXIE. And that's, that's coming to a planet near you. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Yeah, okay, so. great. Um, we're going to ask one more from online, and then we're going to finish up with these three final questions here. And I'll stay here afterwards. Yeah. So if you have any last-minute yeah. questions, come up and ask. Um, as he said, touch the rock. Uh, 
What about moon regolith as outer protection coating to protect the spacecraft from radiation? This is from James Belts. Um, regolith is okay, but it's not nearly as good with things with hydrogen, so water products. Okay. So we're looking at things that are hydrated. We also think, and don't get grossed out, that waste products from astronauts would be great to fill the walls with. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. You gotta do something with it, right? Okay, so but, but that that makes a better ins insulation than, than regular because okay. it doesn't have any hydrogen in it. Put it to those. use. Okay. Yeah. The last three questions. So you mentioned working with SpaceX, Google, Disney, yeah, yeah. and whatnot. What other companies do you outsource to to get technology and products to help with missions? You gotta be careful when it's outsourcing technology because stuff has to be space proven, and when we're doing stuff that hasn't been done before. It makes us a little squeamish making something that you're dependent on that's made by somebody else that may not have flown before. So we're not really necessarily using technology from other people per se. I mean, there may be subsystem or instruments, you know, uh, hemispherical resonator gyroscopes or, or something that we'll use. Um, what we try to do when we're building spacecrafts, we try to get as much of the United States involved in it. But there are some pieces that people can't make either because they don't have the technology or it's too expensive. So we have our own machine shop that'll make them to spec here. You know, I mean, when, you, when you're building a spacecraft, say you wanted to build a Camry, but you were going to build each part yourself. Think how long and how hard it would be to do that. And, and that's what we're kind of doing with these spacecraft. Everyone is one of a kind. We try to get as much contractors to reduce the price of stuff, but it's want to be stuff that they, we know they can make. Thank you. You got it. Uh, this question is related to your earlier one about making fuel on Mars. Right. Uh, about 15 or 20 years ago, there was a group called, I think, the O'Neill Group at uh, Princeton or somewhere. Yeah, Gerald O'Neill. I hope you people don't forget what they, they were doing because they were doing Oh, those stuff. guys did great stuff. Yeah. And it, go even further back, Tsiolkovsky, Oberth, Goddard. Okay. Um, so so for one idea from that area was, was you... Uh, you make fuel on the moon, which is, has a low gravity well, and maybe there's not very much hydrogen there. Not, maybe yeah, what are you using as fuel? Well, you make fuel to go to Mars. Well, no, I know the purpose, but you know, are you talking about water, ice that's in so, Shadow so, Crater? Uh, let me finish. So, so you, you bake the, 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 the uh, lunar soil has like 1% or 2% oxygen. You just use the oxygen. You bake out the oxygen, and you react it with hydrogen you bring from So basically— Where are you getting the hydrogen? You're going to bring that from Earth. So, but the, Earth, the hydrogen only weighs one eighth as much. Okay. So it reduces the weight for. If you want to move a lot of people to Mars, you would, uh, you could, you could get uh, make a lot of fuel up there. I just. There's some people I'd like to send to Mars. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Last question. There is in permanently shadow craters, we believe. Um, I was actually fascinated by the Mars 2020 um, helicopter you had. Um, I got a question. You know, Mars has very little atmosphere and low pressure. Um, you know, when you trying to take off a helicopter on Earth, uh, you've got like the pressure and lift. And how do you overcome the problem with the low pressure and uh, minimal lift? We have two, not one. Pro propeller on it. They're counter rotating and they're going to like 27 or 2800 RPMs. I mean, it's wee! Oh, wait, there's no sound. How much more, <laughs> more like, power input would you have to put in? Say, it's solar powered, and right now they're like, you know, seven, uh, 10 seconds of lift time. It's not going to be long. We're just, this is just this is a technology demonstrator. But we just go really fast and you do the biggest uh, span that you can on those things and just, just whirl them. Cool. And we'll let you know in. The year, how they do. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, thank you. Thank you, you very much. That's more than a year. Um, that is all the time that we have for tonight. Uh, before we thank him one last time, I would like you to join us next month, July 11th and 12th, for Moonstruck. We'll be celebrating Apollo's 50th anniversary. Can we get a big round of applause for our speaker tonight, Dr. Randy Westbrook? Thank you so much for joining us, folks. Have a great rest of your night. Come on down if you have questions or you want to see the meteorites.